Hey folks, Paul Roberts here. For this video, I'm taking a break from my documentary work. to hit this year's pre-spawn feeding binge period. Big female bass are so vulnerable during this particular window of time that I didn't want to miss out, um, didn't want to miss it. And I didn't think you'd want to miss it either. Right. So here are the results of that bit of binge period adventure that I stole time for. Uh, video fishing journal number 19. In this one, we're going to hit a water body that I'd never fished before. Uh, the theme being how I go about deciphering a new body of water. Uh, we're going to do some pre-trip planning together and then hit the water and see how my plans stack up to reality. Now, as you've probably already noticed, um, the length of this video, <laughs> um, I'm going to be laying a lot on you here. Uh, and, and I can't cover it all, regardless how long a video it is. Um, that's what a channel's for. <laughs> But I can show you how I break down a water body, a living aquatic system, and go about the pre-trip planning process. My hope is that your seeing this process will help you in asking good questions about your own waters. Uh, we'll start wide and general, and then home in. Uh, eventually seeing and fishing the actual lake together. Okay, bounce, bounce. Oh, there's one. Whoa, that really sucked it. This feels heavy. Whatever it is, it's heavy. Yep, this is a heavy fish. I'll get back that drag. There's real stuff going on down there. It could be actually likened to a play with a cast of characters on stage and events. That's con conditions and circumstances being imposed on it all. Real interactions between the fish, the lake, and the other living things uh, that are there. To get inside those interactions, I break things down into three main elements. I look at a water body structurally, that is how it's physically laid out, functionally, that is ecologically and behaviorally, uh, how the different living things interact, and lastly, what role local conditions and circumstances will likely play on the whole show. The structural components could be seen as the what and where, the stage on which the show is set, the functional aspects, the whys, um, and there, the show itself. And the conditions and circumstances, both trending and present, run the show. The first thing I do is read what I can find out on our target water body online. Most small waters, however, may have little info available. Most fishing reports are not always terribly helpful, uh, except maybe to give us a flavor of the place, uh, see a few picks. Uh, the fish picks can be encouraging, uh, you know, seeing good-sized bass held up for the camera. However, do pay attention to the dates there, because water bodies and their fish populations will change over time. You can expect that. Beyond the picks, an awful lot of fishing reports offer little else, uh, most often reporting a list of lures tried to divine, you know, what the fish wanted. This has always struck me like someone talking about a specific car engine repair, say, uh, but only in terms of a list of tools that were then randomly thrown at the engine. <laughs> I generally see fishing as diagnostic, specifically applied to the water, and the conditions in front of us. Lures are tools appropriate to that water and conditions. Now, there is magic in those lures, uh, what the manufacturers like to say, there is, but that magic is most apt to appear when they're applied appropriately. This at least is the plan. We don't actually run the show, at least until we're 
dialed in to something specific that we can take advantage of. And dialing in takes work. Uh, and that's what these video fishing journals are all about. The opportunity to put our ever-growing knowledge uh, to the test. Another great source of pre-trip info can be your fisheries department folks, uh, especially on the, the functional ecological stuff uh, that, that tends to require professional expertise to get solid information on. I've found that they're often very willing to help. Um, after all, they work for you, the public. Uh, pretty good folks they are. I've found, uh, although sometimes a bit gun shy. <laughs> uh, I could tell a few stories myself along those lines from my own time uh, in the role as a public servant in fisheries and wildlife. Uh, so I tend to be pretty appreciative of the people in those positions. Next, and where we're going to spend a, a chunk of time together is satellite reconnaissance, uh, perusing satellite images. To start so that these images can make more sense to us on that uh, important functional basis that, I, that I, I really tend to highlight. Let's first get a basic picture of what our bass will be doing when we arrive. We're smack dab in the middle of the pre-spawn feeding binge period, something that I've introduced in previous video fishing journals uh, shot during the early spring. Uh, you can, if you're interested, you can specifically look at video fishing journals 15, 16, and 17. In our spawn documentary, you would have seen this basic diagram depicting bass movements from their deeper, usually main lake winter quarters into shallow feeding areas um, with the warming waters of spring. Being in the pre-spawn feeding binge period right now, we can expect mature bass to be showing up in feeding areas. So what might this actually look like on a real water body? So here's our lake. Ta-da! <laughs> the one we'll be fishing. It's a roughly 30-acre flatland reservoir, uh, meaning it's contained by pretty flat land, resulting in a so-called dishpan contoured lake. So let's break into it. One of the very first things I consider that affects how aquatic communities function is water clarity. Uh, and, and several satellite images across time, um, as you can often find in Google Earth, uh, can give us uh, a basic idea of water clarity. In general, water clarity gives us a bead on how much light is available for plant growth, how deep bass habitat may extend, and uh, factors into the bass's predominant hunting styles. Each of these things influence the rods, lines, and lures, or the tackle that we might uh, want to have along. Next big question, what cover exists there? Uh, the summertime satellite images of this little res suggest lots of vegetation, uh, likely very dense. Uh, my hope was that it would have died back during the winter. Um, this is often, but not always, the case, uh, being mostly dependent on the amount of, of sunlight uh, the plants receive through the winter. If there's a lot of snow on the ice, it can kill things off. Um, if you have very little snow and you get a lot of light penetration, uh, you know, plant growth can, can make it through. It always dies back, but um, uh, that varies. Vegetation that's too dense, though, can make it difficult for bass to hunt, um, although some do figure it out, and, and I can't wait to share that with you in uh, a future documentary on hunting behavior. Dense vegetation can also make it tough for us anglers to comb through uh, in trying to identify the precise areas that could focus fish activity, um, at least in a, a timely manner. You know, day, uh, Fishing days, unfortunately, are painfully short. There also may be wood cover. Uh, this is common in reservoirs. Uh, it's flooded land, but wood eventually rots away as reservoirs age. Um, in our lake, we can see some shoreline brush and trees, uh, both overhanging and fallen in. Uh, both can count as good cover. What's remaining in the lake basin itself um, uh, remains to be seen. Um, uh, it's an older reservoir. Um, my guess is the original stuff would have would have rotted away, uh, but. You know, anglers can add their own brush piles and, and things like that, so um, uh, we'll keep our eyes open. Then there's rock, okay, uh, the next piece of hard cover. These older flatland reservoirs rarely have much natural rock, and what might be there uh, is all too often inundated by silt over time. Uh, but riprap rock is often used in dam construction, so this is an option worth checking for. Um, I don't see any here in our images, uh, but likely there is some. 
such so-called hardcover, okay, that's rocks and heavy wood, um, is worth uh, uh, talking about a little bit. Uh, it can be really important, especially when mixed in with soft cover like vegetation. When you hear about mixes of cover types, you know, diversity of cover being uh, worth looking for in your bass fishing, a chunk of the reason why, beyond serving as objects for fish to relate to, is because hard cover pieces serve to break that vegetation up, providing cracks through which bass can get at those prey fishes hidden within. Okay, lake bottom contours. This is really the meat of things here. Uh, because the physical layout, the bottom contours of the lake bottom often give us the best bead on how the functional ecological aspects set up. Um, that's the working stuff that, that we're trying to break in on. Um, we're entering the food chain too. So first, I look for how water flows through the lake as water erosion is what formed the reservoir bed in the first place, bef before it was even filled. The inlet channels that cut through the lake bed are often the major corridors of movement for fish from those main lake areas into the shallows, into the productive or fertile arms, bays, and coves that are uh, often used for feeding in the early season, and oft times year-round. Inlet channels may also be the travel routes bass will take to their spawning areas. In most lakes, some areas produce more food, have greater productivity than others. These are areas shallow enough to be within the so-called photic zone, the upper level of the water column where sunlight is able to penetrate, uh, both kicking off and heating up the food chain. Some of the most productive areas are those fertile arms, bays, and coves uh, that often represent the majority of bass habitat in many, if not most, water bodies. Believe it or not, the same can be true in small ponds and, and streams as well, where small areas attract the majority of feeding activity. Uh, and they do so because that's where the food is cranked out. The form productive areas will take, uh, will vary uh, lake to lake, of course, um, um, even even within lakes, and bass are masters, okay, at exploiting many prey types across a range of habitat types. But in general, major food chain production areas are usually related to the lay of the lake bed uh, and its proximity to light penetration. Uh, hence, the critical nature of water clarity and, and depth in our bass fishing. Okay. Getting on to our lake, with this stuff in mind, two main areas in the available satellite images have focused my interest. The two bays uh, at the west and south, where two creek inlets feed the reservoir. Uh, I dubbed them uh, Big Inlet Bay and South Bay, uh, for future reference. Both likely offer expansive shallows that can ramp up the food chain, uh, the small ponds in the larger lake, so to speak. Uh, such areas are often associated uh, with inlets uh, because inlets bring in fresh nutrients from the surrounding land and help fertilize the lower, lower links of the food chain. Uh, gotta feed the little fish to have big fish. Both bays will have uh, creek channels within too, well, which often serve as the deepest water within the bays, uh, provided they aren't fully silted in. Uh, something that's very possible in older reservoirs. Uh, but in dishpan waters especially, even small depth changes uh, can attract fish. Okay, let's focus in a step closer and start looking for locations within these potentially productive areas that will house and feed mature, uh, possibly even big bass. Since we're in the pre-spawn binge feeding period, I'm looking for areas that could provide two key ingredients. Access to appropriate prey and heat. Both can attract fish, but both together often corral our best chances for the best fishing. And if we're looking for bigger bass, um, those, those big females, um, prey is uh, being available is going to be paramount. They love the heat, but Bluegills love the heat more, <laughs> so they often tend to come together.
But I think heat is one of the major draws for fish. Um, and we see this in many different fish species. In the springtime, massive migrations start to move toward the heated areas. And the, that sunlight penetration and that heat is what fires up and drives the food chain. You know, it all kind of coalesces. And that's what habitat's about. So keeping this in mind, I first look for areas with expansive shallows, uh, namely shoreline shelves. Uh, I, I also look for away from shore reefs or humps. Um, these away from shore spots may or may not be visible by satellite. Um, so I would definitely be making sonar passes across open water uh, looking for such hidden food shelves. This being a smaller water body, uh, most structures and small water bodies tend to be connected to the shore. In a larger lake, away from shore areas might make up a larger percentage of bass habitat. On our satellite images, the shoreline shelves here in this lake look pretty clean, uh, probably due to wave action, uh, common on these windswept flatland lakes. Um, or, or they can also be caused by late season water level drawdowns uh, that, that happens in a lot of reservoirs. Either way, clean shorelines promise a large break in uh, the dense vegetation that is often present, uh, offering you know good hunting zones for bass. Looking at our images, the south shoreline shows the most shelf area. Uh, but here, available cover comes into the picture, cover being so important for bass and for their prey. However, these nice broad shoreline shelves we can see uh, appear to show precious little cover that could hold uh, big bass-sized prey. So I next look at the first drop-off, the edges of those shoreline shelves. Much of the shoreline shelves on this lake show a straight uniform edge, suggesting few cover breaks that larger fishes might hunt effectively in, uh, bass in particular. So I look for convoluted shelf edges that could offer broken or visibly ragged cover edges for those fish to hunt effectively in. These south shore shelves do appear to show a decent drop at the lip and some good convolutions and ragged weed edges. So this shoreline appears, from 20,000 miles up anyway, to be the most promising area to start our fishing. Finally, we'll need to factor in primary prey species. Without much info out there uh, on this particular water body, I had to make some educated guesses. So uh, I feel like I can, I can expect uh, sunfishes, particularly bluegills, uh, likely young carp and channel cats, uh, possibly gizzard shad if the water body is large enough. 30 acres is kind of pushing it there. Uh, and, and crayfish. On the water, I found that prey was indeed predominantly sunfishes, um, no surprise. Uh, with crayfish, uh, no shad, uh, uh, and no carp, actually, um, except for mature and reproductively sterile grass carp that are, are planted to help control vegetation. Conditions and circumstances. Best we can do here uh, from, you know, from a distance is to make a guesstimate of water clarity and then look at the weather forecast. I try to plan my fishing around the weather, choosing periods that either promise good fishing conditions or sometimes I may actually purposely choose challenging fishing conditions. Um, and I can be a pig for punishment um, at, at those times. Uh, if you ever see uh, a video fishing journal come up with beating a dead horse in the title, you might want to just skip that one if you don't want to share in, in, in my pain. The value in taking on tough challenges, though, outside of sheer curiosity, which tends to be enough for me, is that we can't always choose our fishing days or trust that a forecast won't go sour on us. Uh, so it sure helps to have some experience making lemonade. Our weather forecast for this trip called for good spring weather, uh, a warming trend following an unseasonably cold spring. I was told there was actually ice on the lake edges just the previous week. Uh, but things were forecast to heat up quickly, uh, hitting the mid-70s by midweek. 
This is the kind of weather trend I like to hit when searching out early spring binge feeding bass. Uh, so I jumped on it. These nice few days were then forecast to be followed by a cold front with freezing rain rolling in. Since this is an early spring cold to cool water uh, feeding binge outing uh, to a lake with good water clarity, possibly dense vegetation, and uh, likely some wood, I'm going to bring along a range of tackle, uh, mostly mid-range medium power stuff and a couple medium heavy power rigs uh, and a, fin a finesse rig or two. The lures I'll be affixing to these rigs can be lumped into three categories that should cover early spring fishing. Horizontal so-called moving baits, uh, such as jerks, cranks, spinner baits, uh, and, and swim baits. Uh, depends on how you fish those. Uh, bottom and cover probers, okay, such as jigs, creatures, tubes, and, and spinner baits again. Uh, and, and the finesse baits, uh, grubs, tubes, uh, jig worms, uh, smaller swim baits, uh, and small crank baits. All right, that's the pre-trip preliminaries. Yeah, it, it's a bit of work. Um, if you're still with me, let's hit the water and see what reality brings. It's tempting when we finally actually see the water to just start flinging lures. Uh, but the first thing I do on a new water body, and even one very familiar to me, is explore. I'll walk the shorelines, kick, paddle, motor, climb high banks, I've even climbed trees, um, and plumb the depths with thermometer and sonar. It's not uncommon for me to spot something worth spending my valuable casting time on, on these exploration runs. In fact, it's pretty common. Our lake turns out to have a maximum depth of only around 10 feet um, near the dam and the vast majority of it four to six. And uh, visibility, um, which is an approximation for water clarity, looks to be a good four feet or more. Thus, light can penetrate all the way down everywhere in this lake. The bottom substrate is obviously fertile and I found nearly wall-to-wall -wall carpeting of dense vegetation, uh, mostly coontail and cara. Apparently, the vegetation had survived the winter uh, very well this year. Just want you to see that sonar right there. That is coontail. And you can see how dense that stuff is. There's a sand bottom underneath it, muck and sand, uh, and uh, tons of coontail. Specifically, at this time of year, I'm looking for uh, appropriate prey and heat, uh, hopefully both together. Prey is something I try to see signs of directly. Seeing bluegills up on the shorelines or collected at the surface is a sure sign that the binge is on. Our weather forecast appears to be holding. Uh, day one is partly sunny, 65 Fahrenheit with a, a steady 12 mile per hour northwest wind. Um, a decent heating day. Uh, and I get on the water at uh, 2 p.m. To start my initial exploration run, I take a temperature at depth. And see what we got. Nine feet of water, we have 50, 51, 50 to 51. This represents the core temperature of the mass of water out there. Uh, the mass of cold water that the heating surface waters would be competing with. Uh, heating is a moving target, happening at the surface, uh, especially calm surfaces, and penetrating or mixing in slowly. With a 51 degree uh, core in such a small, shallow lake, uh, that tells me we're still weeks away from the initiation of the spawn. And that's three weeks of binge feed fishing, by the way. Um, that's almost enough to make one want to quit their job and grow a long beard out there on the water. <laughs> I then do a quick check of surface temperatures around the lake. Uh, surface temperatures are important as that heat will draw bass and their prey into shallower water and have them oriented to the upper part of the water column um, in, in general. Um, that, that's a good thing to know. Uh, this is one reason why jerk baits are so effective at this time of year. Now, with some experiences with how water and whole lakes of it heat, um, I don't have to check surface temperatures everywhere. Areas that take on heat are uh, the surface skin all over the lake, 
uh, especially when it's calm. Uh, wind uh, will roll up the core water beneath, breaking up that surface skin if, if you get too much of it. Uh, the calm wind-protected shallows, banks, and coves, um, areas protected from the massive cold core main lake water, uh, essentially protected from the wind that would otherwise mix the two. Uh, again, you can think of the two as competing for dominance. Uh, which is winning, winter or spring, at any given time or location? This can ballpark clue us into exactly where uh, and how our fishing should be focused. Should we move up into the warmer shallows um, and present aggressively or shrink back to slightly uh, deeper haunts and fish more passively o or something in between? Okay, next heat source, incoming water at inlets can bring in water of a different temperature, uh, warmer or colder. Uh, in our little res, the main inlet feeding Big Inlet Bay was a shallow open creek that heated readily over its length uh, before spilling into the lake. I was actually surprised to see that the bay um, hit 58 degrees Fahrenheit um, uh, on the first day and that, that on our great heating day uh, that was realized on day two, it hit 64. Finally, wind plays a major role in heat distribution within a lake too. Uh, so it's worth keeping track of as your fishing day heats up. Wind factors in by being the primary agent that mixes the warm surface with the colder core water beneath it. Uh, and because warm water floats, it gets blown and uh, essentially skated around the lake, uh, potentially piling up on downwind shores. Uh, we've talked about this in, in other video fishing journals. Our first day's wind on day one was a fairly brisk northwesterly that would pile warm, uh, warm surface water against the south shoreline. Uh, and this was great, um, as that's where we planned to start our fishing. So, with our satellite reconnaissance and some basic on-site groundwork under our belts now, uh, we at least have a bead on potentially good starting areas. It's time to go with what we've got, plan our approach, and make our first cast. Being in a kayak, wind direction pretty much dictates our positioning. I anchored at the upwind end of the south shore shelves, the idea being that I'd be able to pull anchor and stair step my way downwind, hitting each ragged shelf edge one by one. I slid quietly into the top of my plan beat and spied a slot, uh, a funnel shaped inside turn uh, with a nice ragged edge that led into the south corner of uh, the big, big inlet bay. I dropped anchor and uh, made our first cast of the trip. All right. A uh, potential nice spot here. right off this little, this uh, big flat downwind shore. Uh, this is like the mouth of a entrance to that. There's one, got one first cast. Oh, and it's a big fish. I think this might be a netter. <laughs> hold hooks, hold. Yeah, that's a big fish. Whoa! Just saw my boat. Or heard the banging. Come on up, honey. Whoa, one hook. And the net. All right. Well, we'll turn the camera down so you can see her. Okay, whoa, 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 that's not good. That is not good. We do not need a blind bass. It's just on the edge. Oh, this is not good. Free it up, free it up. Mm, boy, that is close. Okay, I need the hemostats. Oh man, honey, honey. Get that. There, there. The eye is safe. There's a little, she's gonna have a little. Oh, 
Oh, okay. There is <laughs> a five plus female, and look, she's feeding. Okay, binge is on. She's not quite dropping eggs. How's that for the first cast, folks? <laughs> Let me pick this camera up. Look what's in her mouth. Look what's down her throat. Can you see that? There is a very large panfish. Can you see that down in there? Oh my gosh, that's a big, it's a big sunfish. I don't think it's a bass. It's not, it doesn't have a black tip tail. Okay, honey. <sighs> going to get a measurement on her. I have a scale, but I don't care much about weights. I can pretty much tell. And we're going to take you to 20. All right, hon. All right, honey. There she goes. I continued on through my beat, hoping to draw aggressive bingers on those ragged edges with jerk baits and lipless cranks, and doing as much recon as fishing, still curious what advantages I might find. I finished day one on the downwind side of South Bay, uh, where heated surface water had blown, uh, reaching 56 degrees Fahrenheit. This was off my shelf beat. Um, but warm water had been blowing into the bay um, all day long uh, and it was well worth checking and uh, I have to say my anticipation grew as I got closer to that, that heated shoreline. So the scoop here is, oh look at all the midges on the water. So, okay we got little bass, we got bluegills, we got everybody, all right. Uh, we got heat, 55.8 here, the wind has been blowing, surface water is in all day. I've got my heat, that means I've got lots of, uh, lots of fish, lots of prey fish, and that means bass are here. To find a carnage zone is to find where the prey and the bass are uh, consolidated. All right, so here's what we're going to do. It's blowing against the bank. The warmest waters are on the bank. Let's go see if there's some cover and prey fish on that bank. Pretty darn shallow in there. Yeah, I should put the shallow runner on. Oh, there's a fish. Little guy, I think. No, regular old bass. All right, come on in, fella. Don't do it. All right. Nice. There's my stats. That's on a little piece right there. There we go. All right, you let go with that. All right. All right. Yeehaw. All right, we're on them. Let's hope for a carnage zone. What do you say? Well, oh, there's another one. Oh, they're in here. Whoa, that's a fast fish. Well, it looks like this camera's dead again. I'm not gonna be able to use that battery. All right. Ooh, that's surprising. All 
right. Oh, yeah, honey. Okay, another pretty fish. Just about, just about 16. <laughs> All right. I think it's time to go in. Let's roll. Okay, the edge is literally right here. And I got a ragged edge. Oops, let's keep that there. 6.9, let's move up. It's really thick here, so you have to you were retrieving over the weed beds. Where's the edge, man? And it's all weeds. Today was to hit 75 Fahrenheit with little wind, and it did. Yes! A major heating event. My friend Benjamin was to meet us mid-morning. Um, it's always helpful to have more good sticks on the water when trying to figure things out. I hit my slot first, blanking. Okay, uh, and then waited for Benjamin out in the mouth of South Bay, finding an, uh, a, a pile of smaller bass to keep me busy, uh, all happy to smack both darting and popping jerks. Uh, when Benjamin arrived, we, we caught up a bit and then chopping at the bit to get, get fishing, uh, we went our separate ways for more recon fishing. Slack line dance. There's one got hit right there. Not a big fish. <sighs> Up you go. White lips and there's there's a there's food and there's a tail down in there. How fun is that? Adios. There, I got hit. <clears throat> Another little guy. <clears throat> All right, little guy. like that. Made it. Yeah. 
Me too. When did you actually make it out? I got on the water at 2 o'clock yesterday. I was hoping to go the night before, but just couldn't get out. So I may, st we'll see. We'll see how today goes. May stay an extra day. Or a motel? Yeah, there's a little motel there, and uh, <laughs> it's just fine for a fisherman. <laughs> With the heating opportunities the day promised, uh, my plan was to spend quality time up in Big Inlet Bay. Uh, by then, the day had heated nicely and there was little wind, uh, and I found that big shallow bay had reached 64 Fahrenheit. Now, if someone had simply looked at their surface temperature gauge, they might have thought the spawn was on. <laughs> but the majority of the shallow lake, uh, remember, was still cold, with a core just breaking 50 Fahrenheit. Uh, the, the immediate shallows were nice and toasty. The lake itself was cold. As I recon fished up through the bay, I found it to be very shallow, uh, the majority three feet deep or less. I was hoping, of course, to find some uh, a honey hole up there, uh, you know, well up in, um, in, a deep pocket or channel cut up in that warmed water, um, or some substantial cover that might hold mature bass and their prey. Uh, but the bay proper was too washed out and, and too silted in. This is kind of boring over there, but I'm going to hit that bank just because it's four and a half feet um, and it's possible. See those overhangs right there? That's that's cover. I caught him on that shore. I caught a big one back there. Did you? So I caught him on that but not necessarily in this area. Too. This is just this is just night it's just silt and nitella and it's just really shallow. But um, so it gets a little deeper that's the you know the creek channel. So I concentrated my fishing on the bay's main channel, um, uh, from its upper reaches where I could, st I could see it, um, on down into the lake basin. This is the, uh, that flat, that really heated up flat. It's 62 degrees here. Um, there are previous year's beds up in the head of this place. There's no cover here, but I'm looking, this is the creek channel, and it's really shallow, and there's essentially no cover. But I'm going to drift down it and find cover. I see cover coming up, and that is that overhanging tree that counts. As does the log jam over there, if there's depth there. Unfortunately, I hadn't done the work to map the channel, uh, trying instead to follow it by eye, uh, looking at landforms and weed edges, uh, you know, recon fishing style. Uh, I didn't find a fish, and it turned out later, when I finally did map the channel, late on the, the final day, that I simply wasn't able to follow that channel by eye. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, Benjamin had to head on uh, home, and um, neither of us had, had put very many, many fish in our boats. Uh, it's a good indicator of what uh, uh, recon fishing, okay, uh, uh, how it can bite you if you really haven't done the work to find more precise, precise areas. The anticipated cold front uh, that was forecast with freezing rain uh, appeared to be stalling, uh, providing possibly another good heating day. But when I awoke that morning, the front was descending, bringing a deep, dark overcast, mid-40s air, and a biting wind. Surface temperatures, though, were holding fairly constant at 53 Fahrenheit over most of the lake, uh, despite the, the rapidly dropping air temperature. Uh, this lag time is common uh, because water really does hold on to its heat. I started my fishing once again on my original satellite-informed beat, uh, starting at my slot where I taking that fiver on, on day one. There's one. Shark bait. Good fish too. 
Oh, get this rod out of the way. Get out of my anchor line. Yeah, 17, 18er anyway. All right, stay pinned, honey. Stay pinned, honey. Oh, one hook on the corner. Let's hope there's a tendon there. Come on, babe. All right, here we go. A little more line. Come on in, hon. Yes. All right. Female. <laughs> Drop back out of that bay, huh? Or at least crowded up here. Those temperatures a little much for you yesterday? What was the scoop with you? Any food in there? Nope. All right. That is a pretty fish. Look at that. So she's probably 17 uh, and in good shape. Guessing at 17 inches and with eggs and food in her and good, good body condition, she's three pounds. Um, usually you need 18 inches to get three pounds, but I think the condition is good with these guys. Okay, honey bear, let's get you back. <sighs> Yeehaw. All right. Let's try again. I'm up on top of that edge. There's food up there is the deal. Okay. Bounce, bounce. Oh, there's one. Whoa, that really sucked it. This feels heavy. Whatever it is, it's heavy. Yep, this is a heavy fish. Okay, back that drag off. Don't let that hook pull out. This is a big fish. that drag off. Oh. Maybe it's just got weeds. Ah, <laughs> oh, gill plate. All right. Come on up, mama. Yeah, it's not that big. She's good, but got a gill plate hook. That's what it is. Good fish, though. Oh. Oh, yes. And this one's pushing five. I actually have a scale and I think I'll weigh her. Oh, she's really hooked. All right. Gill plate first. Right behind the gill plate. Really in there too. All right. And the rest is out. Oh, I thought that was a seven pounder. It's funny, your fish are always biggest two times, when you first hook them and when you first pull them out of the water. All right, all right, sweet pea. No food in there. Oh yeah, whoa, she's strong too and she's feeding. Okay, she's defecating, got that. The binge is on. Uh, I'm going to weigh her, and I'm going to say she's in the four pound, four and a half, four and three quarter. That's what I'm going to call her. All right. All right. Let's crank this little end a little bit. 
Okay, I found my females. I found a pod of females. I'm so glad that I stayed on this last day. Darned interesting. What is so interesting is that uh, they weren't yesterday during the sun and the heating. They were nowhere to be found, and I assumed that they were moving in on that heat. What's your guess, folks? I'm getting four and a half. And I'm guessing she's 19, just about 19 inches, a little less. All right, in you go, honey. <laughs> There she goes. <sighs> I sort of got in there. I'm not moving too much. Oh, there's a fish. She <laughs> followed it up. I saw him come. <laughs> I saw that fish come up. All right, we'll land you on this side, little fella. Hmm. That's a lot of hooks. And I just hooked my trolley line. yourself let's get up there oop forget about this plug and wind there's a fish Okay, I think the pond has just come alive, is what it is. All right, honey. There's a 16er. What were you squirting? Urine. Seriously. <laughs> Careful, there's three hooks on this baby. I'll take those. And this is a twist because you want to pull it off the barb. Um, this one I'm just going to do by hand. In the way it came in. Oops, don't hook again. There it is. It's under the tendon, so I don't think it's through it. Don't kick, honey. There it was. Out the way I came in. Another damaged dorsal. This one's 15 and something inches. Nice chunker. Adios, honey. With the shallows now cooling and Big Inlet Bay having heated so well the last few days, the obvious next step was to try and make up for lost time and map that creek channel out at the deeper mouth, uh, mouth of the bay. Uh, this is where a bunch of bass are. Uh, I just had to find specifically where. Uh, wish I'd already done it uh, because I, I found that the channel uh, meandered really nicely, cutting uh, nice sharp bowl-shaped uh, turns, uh, creating a nice sharp vegetated point, um, and even swung by a, a, a nicely placed brush pile. Uh, somebody was onto that. 
However, by then, the front was building. Uh, surface temperatures had uh, only just begun to erode, but the wind uh, started picking up um, enough that I began to fear that, that, that uh, some of those gusts might surprise and even swamp my little kayak. So I decided it was uh, prudent to call it. Uh, get, get home, lick my wounds with some post-trip evaluation, uh, and, and essentially map what I learned about this little lake, overlaid onto a satellite image, of course. Uh, Benjamin was home mapping too, so next time we'll have a much better understanding of the physical and functional nature of, of that lake. Uh, looking at my updated satellite map, uh, my wheels are already turning. Oh yeah, one more stop on the lee side of the lake where I found that aggregation of aggressive uh, uh, smaller bass just to see if they're still biting. There's one. Popped it as soon as it... And... Popped it during some jerks. Jump. Sort of. Okay, honey. <sighs> Fourteen or so. Okay, get out of there. Yep. Little chunker. Losing the red teeth. All right, honey. I should probably skedaddle. As much as I'd like to keep fishing. Mm. All right, let's roll. Yep. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thought you had a snack, huh? How's your eye? I guess you're okay. Look at you. Yeah, I think that rapala's got you. <laughs>